Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You are here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know, as I do, that having potential is not the same thing as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you execute on your dreams. All right, I am freakishly excited about today's guest. He's one of the most respected minds in all of neuroscience, and his name is often uttered in the same breath as some of the most enduring names in the history of science. His insightful and quite frankly badass experiments, coupled with his ability to boil the insanely complex down to the super simple, has made him one of the most sought after lecturers living today. He's done multiple TED Talks and additionally, he was the Gifford Lecturer of 2012, an honor reserved for history's brightest minds that dates back to the 1800s and has included such legendary figures as Niels Bohr, Roger Penrose, Werner Heisenberg, and Carl Sagan. He obtained his PhD from Trinity College at Cambridge, received two additional honorary doctorates as well as the Henry Dale Medal, and Richard Dawkins once called him the Marco Polo of neuroscience. Please help me in welcoming the best-selling author of The Telltale Brain, Phantoms in the Brain, and A Brief Tour of Human Consciousness, the man who created the astonishing mirror box and taught me more about the mind than anyone else, V.S. Ramachandran. Yes, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Please take a seat. Welcome. Thank you. So this is a long time coming for me mm -hmm. uh, as somebody who really felt uh, a victim to circumstance, a victim to my own mind. My journey really began <coughs> with learning about the brain. And thankfully, that journey began with you and reading The Telltale Brain was the first one that I read. Mm -hmm. But I think the one that impacted me the most was probably Phantoms in the Brain, mm -hmm. uh, which was just utterly revelatory in terms of the way that the brain impacts us. One of the most interesting things that I found in your books are the profound ways in which the brain is malleable and we can make changes. How much do you think, and, and God, this will be interesting depending on what you say, but how much do you think that we can really rewire, consciously rewire our own brains? It may be a while, but we're, we're headed the right direction, I think. I mean, the old view of the brain, when I was a medical student, one of the things I learned was the brain consists of isolated modules. This is a caricature, but roughly people believed that isolated modules specialized for different functions. And the modules don't talk to each other. There's a vision one, and there's a touch one, there's a hearing one, there's a foresight one, there's a wisdom one, there's a memory. And they hardly interact. They're all hardwired, laid down at birth by the genome. Mm. And uh, that was it. That was, and you study each module hoping to understand the brain. Now we're saying the exact opposite is true. Our research has shown, patients with phantom limbs, for example, that first of all, these so-called modules are not hardwired. They're constantly interacting with the environment they're immersed in and with other people. There's a sort of dynamic interplay of signals back and forth between the environment and the mod module in the brain. The module and the skin and bones, as I'll explain in a minute. Mm. And each module is talking to, interacting powerfully with modules of other people's brains. So not only is it interacting within the brain, but it's crossing over to other brains using mirror neurons. Right. So this gives you a very dynamic picture of brain function embedded in society, embedded in social interaction, em embedded in your physical body, physical flesh, anchored in the physical flesh of the body. It's a very dynamic picture of the brain, which is highly malleable, even though the basic scaffolding is laid down at birth. This is a very, very radical view of the, looking at the brain. You know. So I, I want to get back to mirror neurons because you have a really fascinating view about how mirror neurons are essentially the thing that allowed us to rapidly progress as a species one by essentially things. giving birth to culture. Right. One of the things, yes, not to oversimplify the brain. Um, but what I want to, I want to go a little bit deeper first on, plasticity. Um, yeah, plasticity and, and how it's usable. So <laughs> um, one, have you used it in your own life? If so, how? And if not, how have you seen it with patients? To give you a couple, a couple of striking examples, uh, if you amputate somebody, he develops a phantom arm. You know, you amputate the arm, he develops a phantom arm in more than 98% of cases. Very vivid experience of the fingers, of the palm, of the wrist, right there, but he, he doesn't see it, obviously. He knows it's not there. Mm. He's not delusional, but he experiences this phantom. He will reach out and grab a cup, will answer the phone, will wave goodbye. <laughs> Very vivid sensory experience. Now, major turning point in my career was when I saw a patient about 20 years ago 
who was sitting there, he had a phantom limb, phantom arm, and he'd come to see me because of, he knew of my interest in neurology and brain function. And uh, he said he has a phantom that, that moves around and, you know, reaches and grabs objects and telephone when it rings. And I, out of a whim, I put a cup of coffee in front of him, an empty cup. And I said, can you reach and grab that cup of coffee with your, with your phantom? And he smiled at me. He said, sure. And then as he was reaching for it, I grabbed it and pulled it away. <laughs> and and the, my question was very simple. Will the phantom then shoot out? Mm. Like that rubber hand in that movie with, the, what's his name, Jim right. Carrey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And will it shoot out? Because why should the physical limits of the flesh apply to a phantom? Mm. It was just a kind of a silly question if you think about it, right? That's not what happened. And I pulled it to me, he said, he said ouch. I said, I said, what do you mean? He said, ouch, it's painful. I said, what do you mean? I, said, I already grabbed the handle when you pulled it. Wow. And I said, there's no handle, there's no cup, there's no, you know, there's no arm, there's no fingers. What the hell is going on here? The brain is vastly more mysterious than we realize. So here is a phantom man reaching out, grabbing a cup. That, that in itself is surprising. And I pull the cup away from the phantom and he feels phantom pain and, y right. and yelps. Right, and That's so interesting. So I know you're obviously approaching it as a researcher, as a neurologist. I approach that, that exact same phenomenon as an entrepreneur. There was a period in my life where I was, ah, God, I didn't feel like I was depressed at the time, but as I described the symptoms now, uh, we'll call it bordering on depression. I was laying on the floor, my face mashed into the carpet, just feeling hopeless and feeling like, what can I do, right? And it was researching the brain that allowed me to get out of that state because I realized <coughs> if the brain is that powerful, that an arm I do not have can experience pain based on you pulling a cup away from it. What's it doing to me now, right? Yeah. How, because that's not real, right? But how much in my situation right now, this feeling of hopelessness, I actually have the chills thinking about it, this feeling of hopelessness is you've, it real? you've triumphed over. Right, yeah. like can, can I do something? Can I change it? If, if, if there's a mechanism at play, whether it's mapping or whatever, and you've been referred to as the, the mapper of the brain. So if this is, eh, it doesn't necessarily, that particular thing doesn't necessarily have to be mapping. And if I could begin to understand these things and how they were being used against me, essentially, could I flip it and use it for me? So anything we, we study, we have three agendas. One is, is it real? Second question, what's going on in the brain? You know, what, why does this happen mm. in some, some individuals? Third question, who cares? <laughs> you know, is why it, is it important? Is, yeah. Why is it important? Can you put it in a broader context? So we did that with phantom limbs. We developed a cure for it, which we can return to later if you want. Mm. Uh, then there is, we did this for synesthesia, for example. Synesthesia is a condition where people see colors when they see numbers. Right? Black and white numbers, I give you a number five and you see black and white. So these people will say, I see red, or I see green, or blue. Different numbers elicit different colors, stable throughout your life. Passed on from generation to generation. So your parents are also synesthetes, so it's a genetic basis. Mm -hmm. What causes it? Well, we discovered that there's an area in the brain for colors, in the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobe. There's an area for numbers, the visual appearance of numbers. And these are sitting right next to each other mm. in this huge brain. And we said, what's the likelihood that some people have this quirk, they see numbers as colored, and the number area and color area are sitting right next to each other in the brain, right? So we said in these people, maybe there's some cross-wiring, accidental cross-wiring. So when you see the five, number five, number five lights up in the brain and cross-activates, cross-wiring, the red, red, red color, or right. seven might be green color. Now again, you may say, well, Dr. Ramachandran, you, you showed that, that there are neurons in the brain in, 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 in area, number area, which fire, and activate the color area in V4 this cross-wiring, so these people have this weird phenomenon, they see colored numbers. So what, what should I care, right? So it turns out that synesthesia is eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists. That's why we should care, so that gives you the clue. Why should it be eight times more common in artists, poets, and novelists? But first we need to ask, why does it run in families, synesthesia? And why is there this cross-wiring? You don't see cross-wiring in normal people. When you see five, you just see five black and white. You don't see it colored. These people are cross-wired, so they eat colored. That's because all our brains are cross-wired when, when you're a fetus, when you're an infant. Everything is connected to everything. And as the child evolves, as the child grows up, the excess connections are pruned away. And what you're left with is a characteristic modularity of the adult brain with different specialized area for color, number, mm. alphabets, and so on and so forth, right? If the pruning gene, which causes this pruning to occur and removing all the excess connections, right. mutates, then you get defective pruning. So these connections are left behind from infancy. So every time you see a number five, you see a color, red. 
So this is the basis of synesthesia. If you propose, and since then it's been confirmed in many labs. Mm. It's not the only thing that's going on, but it's one of the things that's going on. I don't know how to take control of it yet, but I find synesthesia so fascinating from a creative standpoint. Do you know Vladimir Nabokov? Yes. All right, so supposedly a synesthete. Absolutely. Um, he wrote... I think it was Lolita in English, and it was his like fifth language or something. And I thought, wait a second, this guy wrote a book in his fifth language better than I can write in my first. Like it's, it's crazy to think that, and so the reason it's important to me to develop a theory of how I can leverage this in my own life mm -hmm. is <laughs> obviously gaining control of the brain. And, and to anybody watching, guys, the, the whole point of all learning about the brain, the whole point of that is to really begin to understand the things that you can use in your own life to empower you, to pick a direction, to know what you're going after. So when I think about Nabokov, um, and I think about, here's a guy who found truly his calling, right? His calling was to deal with language because there was so much crossover either between metaphor, emotion, That's color terrible. language, something, <laughs> right? And I know that you've talked very powerfully about how metaphor is sort of on the spectrum of synesthesia. Walk us through that. Walk us through how, like, is there a way for me to, as somebody who's not a synesthete, are there ways to train my brain to draw more of these connections? It's a fascinating question, and we haven't quite got that yet, but we're getting there, I think. With synesthesia, so there's this gene that causes excess connections. We go, there are what are called transcription factors, which allow the gene to be expressed selectively in one region. Mm. If it's expressed selectively in the fusiform gyrus by the number area and color area, they get cross-wired and you get number color synesthesia, and that's no big deal. And it helps them remember phone numbers. Unlike us, they see a spectrum of colors in front of them. <laughs> Not very useful these days with uh, yeah, cell phones. Exactly. But, yeah. but it turns out if the gene is expressed diffusely, which can happen, mm. then you get more cross-wiring throughout the brain. Now that, I claim, is the basis of creativity and metaphor. But when the bard Shakespeare said, it is the East and Juliet is the Sun, you don't go, Juliet is the Sun, does that mean she was a radiant fireball? <laughs> Actually, <you> could, <laughs> it's not a bad metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. He meant she was radiant, she was nurturing, she was warm, she rises in bed like the sun rises in the east. I mean, you can make any number of connections you want. She's the center of my solar system, like the sun is the center of the solar system. Right. And Shakespeare is a master of, of doing this. I bet Shakespeare might have been a synesthete, I'm not sure, but it could have been a synesthete. But synesthetes have more connections throughout the brain, and therefore if concepts and ideas like sun and Juliet and, are enshrined in different neural architecture in different parts of the brain, even far-flung regions of the brain, ideas and concepts, the excess connections across the brain creates a greater propensity to link seemingly unrelated ideas and concepts. Mm. And that's the basis of metaphor and creativity. So now you can get to the molecular basis. You can clone the gene, look at the brain connections, molecular basis, neural basis of esoteric abilities like creativity mm. for the first time in, 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 in history of neuroscience and brain research. This is now how you can tap into it, now that's a big question. Yeah, get please. To that. Yeah. No, 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 please jump in. Well, I was gonna say, there we're still we just scratch the surface. We don't know quite how to harness it, this ability, a sort of genetic engineering or something. Hey. But I would say in schools, and in, in fact in your own life, poetry has a tremendous role. I think we should all try to become poets. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, because poetry and laughter and humor, because humor involves unusual juxtapositions of ideas. So there's a lot in common with creativity, and not surprisingly, many very creative people mm. have a great sense of humor. I mean, the only exception would be Germans who... <laughs> Any Germans in the house? We're exceptionally creative, as you know. So, um, telling, this sounds frivolous, but you know, having courses on humor and laughter, even in school. Wow, well, let me derail us for a second. So, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a stand-up comic. Oh. So, I would spend every day, every day, Monday through Friday, at lunch, doing stand-up routines. For my table, not like in front of the whole school or anything, but for my table. Practice, 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 day after day after day after day. So when people ask me, because my verbal skill is something that people would say, because I don't claim to be smart, right? I've worked my ass off to get educated. I don't claim to be smart. And people say, yeah, but you have such an easy time talking. And I always point to the time that I spent every day, every day, every day, practicing, practicing, practicing. And that just using the sheer number of words, especially because I was still <laughs> developing, like at that time, I'm sure I impacted the size of the verbal centers of my brain. But it's interesting that because in writing, one of the things that I find easiest is metaphor. Mm. To, to make disparate connections, and I have this concept that I call thinkitating, which is... 
It's very interesting, yeah. Which is a reference to meditating. So I start by getting in a meditative state, which I'll define as alpha wave, an alpha wave state in my brain. I feel very relaxed, very creative. And I find that I'll make <coughs> really interesting connections at that time. I'll put two things together that I wouldn't otherwise put, but I have to put my mind to it, right? I have to pick a problem and say, this is what I'm going to think about in this alpha wave state. And then I just find that, whoa, like these really far-reaching things will come together and, we'll connect, and reconnect, yeah. which I never thought of as being sort of on that spectrum. But it's interesting that, I don't know if there is a tie between my early obsession with comedy and my ability to do that or not, but it's interesting. That's fascinating. And it, it seems to me the strength of your approach is instead of conventional science where you objectively, quote unquote, study mm. somebody's behavior or somebody's perception, you're doing introspection, ex introspective experiments on your own mind right. by trial and error. And to me, it's, it's very fascinating. The real question is, does the creativity in humor, seeing analogies, grasping analogies, seeing connections, which, which can be funny at times, but not always, whether that spills over into other domains or you just become a very funny guy. Right. I mean, this question has not been adequately answered. If I, if I give, introduce it into the school curriculum, a lot of humor, different styles of humor, is it going to make them creative? Or is it just going to end up with a lot of comedians? Can I tell you what it feels like? Yeah. So I ended up doing stand-up comedy quite a bit at one point, um, sort of right towards the end of my high school, beginning of college, and then I stopped. And I wanted to take myself very seriously during college, so I completely stopped it, study, study, study. But about two years out of college, um, I decided, hey, I want to go back to it. And when I started practicing again, just trying to find the funny moments in life, doing routines in the mirror, like getting back into being funny, I could literally feel my brain speed up. Oh. And that's what it felt like. It felt like, and I don't know if that's just how it feels as you begin trying to make these other connections, if some part of your brain is sort of lobbing random things into your mind, I, I, I don't know. But very much the subjective experience is the sense of, I always likened it to an engine where you feel it like turning over and then it just gets very, very fast. And if I couldn't get my mind into that space where I could feel it going quickly, I couldn't be funny. But once I got in there and then I was able to make those random connections, make them quickly, because obviously timing is a big part of comedy. Um, yes, absolutely. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and similarly with poetry, I think there are people who are quote unquote poetry blind. And I don't know if that's congenital or and even if it is, can you modify it? Can you educate people with, with poetry and, and the beauty and, and impact of poetry? And does that help them in other ways or do they just become poets? These are open questions that need to be investigated, but I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing you saying is that there is a tremendous change in the brain which you can experience, and it might spill over into other domains, although you've evolved, evolved it for humor, obviously. That's really interesting. So I wanna, um, I wanna go back to mirror neurons for a second. You had a great quote, I'm gonna paraphrase it, but it went, um, the only thing standing between me and true connectedness is my bloody skin. <laughs> And uh, I found that really interesting. What do you think that says about like human relationships as people try to stop the separatism and feel more connected and feel this sense of unity to know that truly, from an experiential standpoint that can be verified in a lab, the only thing that stands between you and actually experiencing someone else's circumstance right. is a null signal. Um, is it usable? Like, what do we do with yeah, it? Yeah, I think, you know, evolution has seen it fit that for rapid action and for, for its purposes, you know, perpetuating genes in, in your lineage, you need, you need to take shortcuts. And, and, and it says, uh, simplifying assumption is to say, your consciousness stops here. You know, you've got your skin to protect. And that's a different person. But as far as the neurons are concerned, and the mirror neurons, which are firing away and empathizing with another person, it's all one big connected network, which includes other people's brains, not just your own brain. And it includes the skin too, as I told you. It turns out that there's a condition called RSD, if you don't mind my going off on a tangent here yeah, for a please. second. If you have, normally if you have an injury to a metacarpal bone. And RSD is like the swelling, the red, yeah. Yeah, so if you a tiny fracture, normally the finger swells up and becomes red and it becomes warm, inflamed, painful. Mm -hmm. Classic signs of inflammation. And then the bone starts healing after a couple of weeks and then the changes in the skin and flesh reverse. It's called healing, everything is fine. Right. In about 1% of people, the fracture heals, but the fingers remain swollen, red, painful, and immobilized. You can't move that finger. Whole hand becomes immobilized, red, painful, swollen, and warm. The entire arm. Okay. okay. And this, you're stuck with this for life, typically, for, for decades. 
There are 30 treatments, none of which work adequately. The one treatment is sympathetic ganglion block, which helps somewhat. Now, we developed a trick which is now widely known and used for phantom limb pain, but we suggested it could be used for this. On the grounds that when the, ba when the brain had a small injury and it sent a command to move, it's getting a pain signal saying, ow, don't move it, it's painful. And this results in a, a pseudo paralysis. So the brain gives up attempting to move the hand because it's terrified. It says, if I try right. to move it, it's painful. So it learns, it's called learn pain. Now you put a mirror here, hide the a dystrophic arm, swollen arm, painful arm, put your normal hand on the other side, I'm the patient, and look in the mirror and I move my normal arm like that, like that. My dystrophic arm looks like it's moving, mm. because it's not, it's just lying still. Right. I'm sending commands to both hands, only this hand is moving, this hand is not moving. And, 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 and it looks like it's moving, but there's no pain, because you're not moving the left hand. Are you with me so far? Yeah, yeah. So the brain says, look, your left hand is moving fine. You know, and it's not painful, go ahead and move it. You unlearn the learned pain. Mm. And, and then soon afterwards, the experiments were tried on about nine patients, and astonishingly, about half the patient, online, as you watch, here's a patient been have this for months or years. And you watch the normal hand's reflection in the mirror, so the, the dystrophic, painful hand looks like it's moving with impunity. It starts moving. Not, as it, not, not, not only does the inflammation, the pain subside, mm. but the hand starts moving, the paralysis subside, it goes away, the redness changes, the color changes, and the hand stops, stops sweating, mm. and you get the temperature changes, you can't fake that with your mind. So visual input is going and affecting the temperature of the skin right. as you watch with a mirror. Rama, doesn't this stuff freak you out? Like, do you not go home and see what else you can put in the mirror box? And like, what can I do with this stuff? Absolutely. You can go home and play with mirrors and discover all kinds of things. I mean, if I put two mirrors at right angles and put my nose, position my nose correctly so I look, it looks like a normal face, yeah. one half on each side of the mirror. If I blink, you know what happens? Yeah. Mirror image blinks. If I blink my right eye, That's it blinks crazy. its right eye. And he spooks you out. You say, my God, what's it doing? <laughs> right? Unless you know the optics. Wow. You say, you do the same. You go home and try it. It's beautiful. But now comes the fun part. I simply ask you to look at this gizmo and I say, first look at a normal mirror and move your head around like this. Circumduction. Mm -hmm. And you say, fine, you do it. Yeah, I'm doing it. I mean, you look at your eyes. It's important. Look at the bridge of your nose. And... Easy, right? Okay. Now you put two, two mirrors like this, look in the center, do the same thing. You can't. You can't move your head. Oh, you do this. Why? With some practice, you can start doing it very slowly. Because the feedback is wrong. What do, you get, what, what do you get in the normal mirror? You use the feedback of the, of the head uh -huh. to guide your head. And this, this is what we don't realize, that your brain doesn't function in isolation. It's constantly monitoring sensory input. So when you attempt a correction, the head moves the wrong direction. Mm. So you then correct again the other way, and then again it goes the wrong direction. So you get into this feedback loop, and, and you get a pseudo paralysis of the head. So who would have thought that I can put two mirrors in front of you at right angles, like a book, ask you to look inside, and ask you to move your head, and you, you say, I can't move my head. All right, see, this stuff to me is so powerful, <laughs> it's so important. And when you start thinking about the duality of the brain, uh, the corpus callosum, and what happens when you sever the corpus callosum, and you get the you talk about in a second the atheist and the <laughs> the theist. I mean, it's so fascinating. But what I hear in all this stuff is there are things that I can do right now to begin to develop my brain in a way that I want. So there's some guys here just off camera, and they were um, asking me before you got here. Like, oh, hey, you used to visualize, because my wife and I used to drive up into Beverly Hills and look at nice houses, and when we were poor, that's how we stayed motivated. <coughs> and, um, and as they're asking me about this, I get what they're really trying to do, which is they want to know, on those days where they feel insanely lazy and they don't want to do anything, what tricks can they do to motivate themselves? And people write in and ask that kind of thing all the time. And the real question that they're asking is, how do I take control of my brain? Because your brain is fucking with you. Your brain is lying to you. Your brain is making things up. Your brain has multiple voices. And the only thing that keeps them moving in one line is a bit of tissue between them. Mm. But when you find yourself arguing in your own head, it's because there really are two competing voices. There really is one that's fearful, um, that doesn't even have language, talking to one that has language, <coughs> but is you know, much less emotional and, and trying to balance those two out. But when I hear stuff like the mirror box and being able to have, and if you, what's, what are the initials? R, 
FM, RFD? RSD. RSD. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy. All right, so if you look that up on Google, it is so horrifying. It's huge and red and nasty, and you've got people living with that for 10 years. You put it in a mirror box that this man makes for $2, and you can trick your brain into thinking that all is well to the point that you'll begin to see the swelling go down in real time, right? About half the patients. That's fucking crazy. So the brain to me is, is ripe for, I'll take this the wrong way, but manipulation. On yourself, to be able to create a, an improvement, to be able to get yourself moving in a direction. And here, I mean, guys watching the show, the thing that I want to stand for personally is it doesn't matter where you start, it doesn't matter who you are, everyone's a lump of flesh that can't hold its own head up and poops in its diapers, right? That's where we all start. And we all learn to do something over time. Now, you can learn to do that, but man, you've got to learn about the brain. If you're not researching the brain and finding the tricks that it is pulling on you so that you can reverse it and pull it back on the brain, you're missing a trick. That's fascinating. I think, and the point you made about corpus callosum and left and right hemisphere, Studied extensively by Roger Sperry, Gazaniga, Joe Bogan, and various others, right here in Pasadena, actually. Mm. Uh, it raises a fascinating question. That the right hemisphere has its own language. Of course, both hemispheres use the language of nerve impulses. Mm. There are tiny wisps of protoplasm, of jelly, called neurons, and they're firing away 100 billion of these. And, and you know, there's, there's you and me. And, and then there's, you, you look at the world right. out there. And how does all this happen? And it's mysterious. But even, even more directly intriguing is that the right hemisphere speaks a different language of emotions, introspection. Or the left hemisphere is, is conventional, what we refer to as language, spoken language. Mm. I think it's more fundamental than that. There's a translation barrier between these two hemispheres. When you, when there's, this, there's this musical scale, this extraordinarily beautiful, uh, a flourish here, a flourish there, Mozart or Indian classical music, Raga, Darbari, Kannada, or something like that. So there is improvisation going on, and then there's a musical scale or melody. That says it all sometimes. That's interesting. And to translate music into words is impossible because it's bad. And I think what happens is music itself is a bridge between the right hemisphere's emotional language, which is hard to convey, and the left hemisphere's propositional language. This is just a far out idea. I don't even know how to test it, but it's the kind of issues that we think about, or starting to think about. Yeah. Um, Michael Strahan, I don't know if you know who that is, is one of the guys on Good Morning America, Hall of Fame NFL um, football player, and he talks about how he'll orchestrate his music depending on what he's trying to achieve. So as he prepares for going out onto the field, about two hours out, he's actually listening to slower tempo music, R&B, it's very emotive. Um, and then as he gets closer to going out, he starts listening to very aggressive music, things that create a brain state change in his mind. And the notion of changing brain states to me is so important because maybe there are just some people that for whatever reason, like they're wired to do X, Y, Z, but take this show for me. So this provokes tremendous anxiety for me. And to be able to come on and perform and calm my nerves, it's like I have to go do this super fucking elaborate like thing to change my brain state to get it where I want. And Tony Robbins talks about instant state changes and things you can do to like really hype yourself up. And I find that I can do an instant <coughs> state change to aggression, but I can't do an instant state change to something more um, subtle than that. So you mean, you mean towards aggression? Yeah, so... In response to somebody's aggressive behavior. No, it doesn't have to be that. But let's say that I wanted to, um, to Michael Strahan. You're about to go out into the football field and you need to like bring it and be a killer. You haven't even seen anybody else yet, but you know you have to walk on just like totally amped up. Um, I have a technique that I use that, that um, I think a lot of people use, which is to, to hit yourself, to have like physical contact with yourself. If I strike my chest really hard in, a, in an instant, Rama, I can like really get amped up. Oh. Or I can put music on that exists in a, a like Jay-Z for me has, if I want to be cocksure, I'll put on Jay-Z. Oh. Like you just, it's got <coughs> this you, like swagger to it. It depends on what I'm trying to do, yeah. right? So, in, in fact, in the early days when I first started doing this show, um, back when it was Inside Quest, I, I had to put myself in a position of confidence because I didn't have the confidence to do the show. Mm -hmm. So I would listen to Jay-Z. Like, that's all I would listen to for like an hour leading up to the show. I'd pace around and just listen to this music just to get myself in the right mental state. And the reason I bring that up is is 
There's so much going on in the brain, but so much of it is controllable. And what's really interesting, and, and we don't have time for it here, but you've talked so powerfully about what it means to be self-aware and how the self can contemplate the universe and contemplate itself, contemplating the universe, right? And like, what does that mean? And to me, once you realize that you can contemplate yourself contemplating, you, you can control it. You can start to steer it. You can move it in different directions. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanna ask is, what is, for a normal person, what's something that they can control and would allow them a better quality of life if they learn to control it? The best, best answer to that is creativity. Creativity, metaphor, poetry, and all of that. So what do you think they can do to practice that? Well, at the risk of sounding frivolous, expose themselves to a lot of poetry, write a lot of poetry, even if it's bad stuff, copy it, maybe if you need to, change it, alter it, eventually write your own poetry, write your own jokes if you can, and hang around people who have a poetic mind, and people who are passionate about what they do, who think of life as a grand adventure. Like, hang around poets. You know, it's cliche, but, but just that, that's, that's the key. It is cliche. But in terms of actually using the brain and tampering with it, we don't, we're not there yet. That can be undoubtedly be done maybe 100 years, 20 years from now, but not, not anytime soon. Well, let's bring it a little bit sooner. So I know that your mirror box came from VR. You right. saw VR and thought, well, I can't afford that because it was like 10 or 15 years ago, right? Well, it didn't actually come from VR, but the idea came from when I looked at this patient, the drawing from, from, the, from, the, from the, the cup. Mm. And then saying, ouch, and told me the powerful role of vision in modulating the pain. So I said, vision can cause pain, can also reduce pain. Okay, let, me, let me find a way of correcting this. And then I saw a mirror somewhere in the basement and it must have clicked because I've seen them in museums before. And then the virtual reality came later because people said, you, you cannot use the mirror if you have two hands both amputated. Mm. Then they said, you can start using virtual reality to treat this. And based on the mirror box principle, they started using virtual reality. But you're right, in terms of my initial thought, when I saw this patient doing this, and I said, I need to give him visual feedback from the hand to eliminate pain, not this patient, another patient. I need to give him visual feedback that the hand is moving that might eliminate the pain. The first thing I thought of was virtual reality. I said, I can maybe get this constructed. And then, and then I realized it's horrendously expensive and hit right. on the idea of using a mirror, yeah. Yeah, that's... That, what do you think about the coming VR revolution? Do you think that it's going to be usable? Do you think Absolutely, it's... Absolutely, yeah. I think that you can develop virtual reality tricks for things like anorexia nervosa, something we've been thinking about. That's interesting. Where a patient looks at a mirror image and then says, she's obese, you know, she's fat. And here's some skinny person looking at an emaciated, skinny reflection. Their visual perception is being distorted. Now... Can you somehow change that by giving them false feedback mm. or something like that by creating a virtual reality image of them themselves and then manipulate the image and give the brain some, some version of themselves which makes them motivated to start eating again? Wow. So it's primarily a disorder not of feeding. People think of anorexia as loss of appetite. Not true. Often their appetite is good. It's a body image mm. issue. You know, they, they think of themselves as fat and bloated and they need to lose weight, so they keep losing weight, and sometimes it can be fatal in rare, rare cases. It's a serious disorder. So we've been thinking about the use of virtual reality for that. We're thinking about it for things like OCD. Another use of mirror neurons, by the way, is my mirror neuron fires when you reach and grab that glass, and uh, when I reach and grab that glass, it fires. We already talked about mirror neurons. Now in OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, let's say I'm the patient. I have this constant compulsion to go wash my hand, like Lady Macbeth. And I touch a piece of wood or touch a table or I touch a bathroom door knob, I would immediately go and scrub my hand until it's red and inflamed and skin's peeling off. Right. For 20 minutes, half an hour. And then every hour I have to go back to the bathroom because I touch something. This is extraordinarily distressing for the patient, in addition to the, you know, the skin excoriation. Right. We said, okay, when he gets the urge to go and wash his hand and, and rub his, keeps rubbing his hand, why don't you watch an app you know, of somebody else washing their hand? So it gets rid of the, maybe it'll get rid of the urge back to it. You know. Very simple idea. We, we tried this, Jalal and I, uh, Balan Jalal and I, we tried this, and in about, we're, we're, not, we're not experts on OCD because, you know, there's a very, whole, this whole field devoted to that. Right, sure. And people studying it for years. But we just said, as an amateur, let's just try it for fun. And uh, in three out of six patients, we found that the patient, the patient with OCD traits, not full-blown OCD, mm. they said, 
you know, my, my urge goes away. I don't need to go wash my hand anymore. By simply watching another guy. I mean, think, think about this. And, and, and the patient said, I didn't even expect this. I mean, how, if I see somebody, I should get more, more of an urge because it's frustrating. I mean, he's washing his hand. I'm not able to. But the opposite happens. I watch him wash, wash his hand. It relieves my urge to wash my hand. Yeah. And I don't understand it. Then we explained to him the mirror neuron principle. So another example of tapping into mirror neurons' abilities to cure a seemingly incurable disease. But this is early days. We've seen it only in about a couple of patients, and we're doing rigorous right. tests to establish it. But I just wanted to add that. Very, as well. yeah, very interesting. Now, in a time where people think all the sort of easy, simple discoveries are already done, and now the only thing that's going to work is really expensive lab equipment, how have you been so successful in finding so many new discoveries? What, what's that secret that other people seem to be missing? Well, that's a diff tough question to answer. I think that it's because of the misconception, people think that the more difficult a problem, the more difficult it is to solve. Well, the more, more fundamental a problem, the more important a problem, the more difficult it is to solve. But there is no correlation. Sometimes there's a simple solution staring at you in the face, and you're just, you're just missing it. I mean, to give you a classic example, everybody thinks Newton showed that white light is made of seven colors, right? Everybody knows that. Every schoolboy knows that. Right. Put a prism, had white light going through this from a slide projector or whatever they were using at that time. Lo and behold, you get a rainbow. Newton said white light is made up of seven wavelengths of different colors. And they said baloney. There are about 20 critics of him. He said this is impurities in the glass mm. that's splitting the white color into a spectrum. So Newton's supporters said, that's nonsense. Newton's going to be wrong. Let's get it right. So let's, they polished the prism, purified the glass, again, seven colors. So the critics said, you're not purified it enough. Right. So they went on and on and on, 15 years, 20 years. You know, no matter how much you purify, they can always say there's pure <laughs> impurities. And you can't, and Newton looked at the debate and he said, it takes 10 minutes to show this, right. if they're right or wrong. Why is he spending all the time purifying the glass? It's not going to get him anywhere. He took a second prism, put it upside down in front of the seven colors, collected them, became white again. If you see these impurities in glass, it should become even more colorful. Right. <laughs> How come it's becoming white again? Mm. So I'm right. These people spending 20 years grinding the glass and removing impurities, they don't need, need not have done that. So this simple solution is staring at you in the face and you just miss it. So even today, hundreds of discoveries are waiting to be made without, without high tech. The classic example is the, the cure for ulcers. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a classic example of people thinking that ulcers are caused by back, you know, stress and acid in your stomach and, and so give them antacids or do antrectomy, remove the stomach. People used to do that when I was a medical student. Wow. Right? Now, now you don't need to do antrectomy or vagotomy or any of that, or long, prolonged diets, you know, milk diets and, and no spicy food and all that. You just give them antibiotic. It turns out this, this young resident looked at the stomach slices of, of, of biopsies and, and found that they started with bacteria. Mm. And his professor said, that's a secondary infection from flora, bacterial flora in the, in, in the stomach going and infecting the ulcer. Mm. Now this guy asked a simple question nobody else asked. What was that? He said, how do you know? Yeah. I think how do you know is a fundamental question in science. So every kid should ask his professor, if his professor says something, how the hell do you know it's a secondary infection? Maybe the bacteria are causing the ulcer. Mm. Professor said, but that's, that's not, not, not what my professor told me. The, the secondary infection. He said, how do you know it's a secondary infection? Then he gave people antibiotic to remove the so-called secondary infection. They also went away. <laughs> they also went away. And then he correlated the distribution of ulcers in the population with the distribution of helicobacter. Perfect correlation. Even then, people didn't believe him. He laughed off the stage when he presented this. He took the final step of swallowing the helicobacter. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. And he did an endoscopy, and his lining was studded with ulcers. Then, finally, they believed him. This was about 15, 20 years ago. And then, even then, 10 years, 15 years, they didn't adopt his remedy of swallowing antibiotic. Wow. They said, no, no, there's nothing to do with antibiotics. The average physician, gastroenterologist, would still prescribe this, you know, standard regimen of diet mm -hmm. and vagotomy and some rare cases of antrectomy. Not, not antibiotics. But the antibiotics kicked in about five years ago. People started using it widely. That's Take a course and, then you, and got a Nobel Prize for that. It's a great quote. I think it's by Max Planck. Uh, where he says, people have this um, illusion that when a new piece of information comes out, that people recognize the faults in their old views and adopt the new view and, you know, march forward. He says, what really happens is people begin to die off <laughs> and the new people are just raised on the new truth and then ultimately it becomes accepted. I won't say my, I'm waiting for my colleagues to die. <laughs> 
That's nice, yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, I can't believe that people are that stubborn, but uh, people really cling to old beliefs. But I love that H. Pylori <coughs> story that he was willing to put it to the ultimate test, that he was so convinced he was right that he would go to the lengths of uh, swallowing H. Pylori, which is crazy. Beauty of it is going to have been discovered 100 years ago. Why? Anybody could have done this. Antibiotics, just ask that question. Like 50 years ago. Anybody who had access to antibiotics would have said, let me just try it. Yes, finally. Do you meditate? No, I'm ashamed to say I'm from India and people always ask me. <laughs> and I want to and I, I will soon, but I haven't attempted it yet. For me, what I need is to be able to picture the anatomy of it. Once I understood what I'm really doing is tapping into the parasympathetic nervous system, I'm slowing my heart rate down, I'm slowing my breathing down, I'm in, in essence regaining control of certain things, right? I am now consciously controlling my breathing. And That's very interesting. You're saying that the ability to consciously control these things and be aware of what's going on helped you tremendously, right? Tremendously. Right. Now, that, this is very interesting. But in phantom pain patients, what they'll say is, you've helped me eliminate the pain, but more than anything else, you've told me that a phantom is not a figment of my imagination. It's a construct in my brain, in the body image center, so it's real, I'm not going crazy. And you can put it something as simple as a mirror and, and eliminate it for a while. Rama, I really think it's a big deal. And when you were saying that people, because I promise you, people saw their girlfriend rubbing their phantom hand a thousand times and it didn't give them any relief because the belief they had about it was something totally different. So how could it have that impact? They don't notice it. I mean, you see, but you do not observe as, as Sherlock Holmes told Watson. <laughs> okay, so, so they, they, they've noticed it. Many of my patients have said, well, I've noticed when I'm shaving, I feel something in my phantom, but I told my doctor and he said, it's all, psych it's all in your mind, don't mm -hmm. worry about it. So it's, they all have observed it, but they ignore it. But as you, your mind is tuned to it, so you, you notice it more, or you observe it more. And you see its significance. I think yeah. that's what it and I think that that has significance with the placebo effect. And if, here's, I struggle with the placebo effect because I think it's super powerful and I bet it is really effective. But I worry that if I know I'm trying to trigger the placebo effect, that it won't work. Well, oddly enough, there's, there's an experiment showing it does. Even if I think it's... Now, even if you show somebody that something's a placebo, this is a placebo, the placebo works almost <laughs> to the same extent. That's crazy. Which is very really interesting because... If you take a drug like Prozac, it's 70% effective compared to a placebo, which is 50% effective. The difference is margin of difference is quite small. Wow. So why not give a guy for depression, here's a placebo. Right. But Start we know placebos that. work even when you know they're placebos. Oh. Start them on a trial of that. And then if that doesn't work, then you can, it's a very cheap, the placebos. You know, wow. if it doesn't work, let's switch you to the real Prozac. That, that is amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I can, I'm really surprised that the numbers are that high. And on that line, what is the impact that you want to have on the world? Twofold. One is to, um, whether accidentally or purposefully, make discoveries which help alleviate pain and mental anguish. We have succeeded in, as far as pain is concerned to a tremendous extent. There's nothing more satisfying than a patient who's been in pain for years or months, excruciating pain, coming to you and then going away with some experimental procedure, and a week later he says it's all gone. And every now and then this happens and it makes the whole enterprise worthwhile. Mm -hmm. The awards and honors, that's of course ego trip and it's fun to have, but the main reward is the, is the, the alleviation of pain. Second thing is we are curious about the higher functions of the mind, like you are. What is creativity? What is humor? What is poetry that moves you to tears? What's great literature? All of this, it's all enshrined in the neural architecture of the brain. Mm -hmm. We want to understand the basic elementary aspects of brain function, like how you see a cup, or how you see a table, or how you feel warmth. Once you have done that, you also want to get to the big questions, like how do you construct body image? Mm. What are Freudian defense mechanisms? Can you, if you gain a deeper understanding of them, can you avoid being, avoid self-deception, being more authentic to yourself? Mm. Is it always a good idea to avoid self-deception? Maybe it's, it's healthy in small doses, right? So that's my overall agenda, to understand human nature, to understand enigmatic aspects of our minds, like creativity and uh, metaphor, and how you construct a calendar in your mind and you have the sense of time and place, you're anchored here and now. Right now I'm here in the studio and I'm being interviewed by you, and then a few hours later I'm gonna be in, in, in LA again, back in my hotel waiting for my Uber ride, then I'm gonna go home and then a month later I might be going to India, and I've got this sense of a calendar. Where is it in my brain? What parts of the brain are involved? So questions of that nature, which have no clinical, clinical utility or practical application, but eventually they might because they enrich your understanding of who you are. And that's one of your goals. Mm -hmm. And then once you, once you understand who you are, then you can harness this, these, this knowledge towards practical utility. 
yeah, I'm very excited about all these new inventions and new ideas. And uh, it's important also not to get carried away by them. Some of them have been repeated by many scholars, many groups throughout the world and are implemented widely in clinics. Mm. Some of the other discoveries, still early stages, we barely scratch the surface of the problem, like the calendar in the brain. Or um, another example would be the use of the mirror for stroke. Some of this work is very recent and we need to, qualify, I have to add the qualifying remark that needs to be replicated by colleagues in double-blind clinical trials before they can be accepted as, for routine treatment of patients. Same thing holds for some of our basic discoveries on calendars or any of the other discoveries I mentioned, mirror neurons. Some of them are rock solid, accepted widely. Others are still in the test phase. I love, though, that you do bring things up even when they're early, just to spark creativity and Absolutely. give things to think yeah. about. So long as you make it clear which, which findings are. This is, the, this is the key, whether it's a book or a lecture or an interview. It's your job, not the audience's job, to spell out which part is rock solid, clear, has been established by colleagues and by yourself by repeating the experiment, which part you're skating on thin ice. And I always tell my colleagues to make this clear too when they're giving lectures. Makes sense. Where can they find you online? They go into my webpage in UCSD, CBC, Center for Brain and Cognition, UCSD, and they'll find a list of references to mirror visual feedback, the various treatments that are offered, and my current book, Telltale Brain. And uh, if they go to the Charlie Rose show where I'm in interviewed, so interviews like your interview, Charlie Rose, Rose's interview, TED Talks, that gives you an overview. All great talks, I promise you. I've seen them all. They're amazing. Watch each and every one of them. Rama, thank you so much for thank coming you on the fun. show and sharing with us. That was amazing. Guys, never before have I recommended somebody as aggressively as I'm going to recommend that you dive into V.S. Ramachandran. Nobody has had a bigger impact on my life and my understanding of my own brain and my ability to get a hold of it. And he is so entertaining. You've got to read his book. In fact, I will tell you that one of the alternate titles for Phantoms in the Brain was going to be The Man Who Mistook His Foot for a Penis. <laughs> so there's all kinds of just amazing, hilarious, unbelievable, and always true stories. So go in, check his books out. What you're going to get out of it is not only a, an amazing appreciation for the mind, the ability to then conceptualize it, and through conceptualizing it, be able to actually grab a hold of it and do things in your own life to begin to truly reshape and rewire your brain in the way that you're going to need to in order to be successful. You will find endless applications for the things that he talks about. It is really, really incredible stuff. And the one thing that I hope that you heard him say today, which really struck me, and it was not something I was expecting to hear, which is if he was gonna give you any advice to empower yourself, it would be to study creativity, to surround yourself with creative people, to dig into poetry, and when you understand the entire umwelt of his world and all of the things that he gets into, you will understand why that is the most beautiful advice that he could ever give you, is to really leverage those pounds of jelly between your ears to have a more beautiful experience. That's so fucking cool. I love it. Rama, I cannot thank you enough. Again, thank you very much. On the show. That was amazing. Absolutely. Guys, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You can find me at, at Tom Bilyeu, and you can find this amazing team and everything that we're up to at, at Impact Theory. We are all over the web, so find us everywhere, including Medium, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of it. We're putting out content that we think will make your life better and allow you to be successful in the way that you want. And at the very core of this company is a desire to help you build the company that you want. So if you want to get in, if you want advice, we offer that as well. So hit us up, let us know how we can help, let us do something amazing together. Guys, it's a weekly show, so be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Wow, Rama, man, thank you so much, fun. that was amazing. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Impact Theory. If this content is adding value to your life, our one ask is that you go to iTunes and Stitcher and rate and review. Not only does that help us build this community, which at the end of the day is all we care about, but it also helps us get even more amazing guests on here to share their knowledge with all of us. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this community. And until next time, be legendary, my friend.